The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your parent in heaven. So, whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret. And your parent, who sees in secret, will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your parent who is in secret and your parent who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your parent who is in secret. And your parent who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace be with you, beloveds, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today is day 14 of a hunger strike taking place here in Chicago, organized by a group of activists who are hoping to block the opening of a new industrial metal recycling facility on the Southeast side. The hunger strikers are students and teachers and residents of neighborhoods that have been impacted for decades, for generations by the deadly byproducts of heavy industry. An air quality report conducted by the city of Chicago last summer confirmed what people already knew, that the south and west sides are overburdened by high concentrations of industry. These communities are referred to as fence line communities, meaning that they're situated next to polluting industries or facilities. In this case, we're talking about a community called East Side which sits along the border of Illinois and Indiana, about 10 miles south of LSTC. If we could dislodge our cars from the mountains of snow that they're buried under, and I suppose if we were actually in the chapel in Hyde Park, instead of scattered all over the world via Zoom, we could drive there in about 20 minutes. For those of you who commute from Indiana, East Side is the first Illinois neighborhood you pass through after you cross the state line, and it's home to two EPA Superfund sites, which means that it's some of the most contaminated land in the nation. The ground in this and surrounding communities is filled with the toxic byproducts of the steel plants that once fueled Chicago's economic engines until the industry moved overseas in the early 1980s. Lead, chromium, cyanide, mercury, and manganese. The new facility slated for construction wouldn't be a steel plant. 
Instead, developers are planning to build a state-of-the-art metal recycling facility with the capacity to recycle up to 1 million tons of obsolete metal products annually. These obsolete metal products are sometimes referred to on the company's website as end-of-life metal goods. The concern voiced by residents of the surrounding neighborhoods, which are predominantly Black and Latinx, is that the facility will further pollute the air, contributing to asthma and other respiratory illnesses that disproportionately impact families in these communities. 50 years ago, if you hung your laundry out to dry in these neighborhoods, it would be covered in silicon dust from the steel plants by the time you were ready to take it down. Today, Chuck Stark, a science teacher at George Washington High School, located about half a mile from the proposed site for the new facility and one of the hunger strikers, is worried that the hazardous dust particles produced by the recycling machinery will be inhaled through the noses and throats and lungs of his students. And so today, this Ash Wednesday, I'm imagining the dust produced by the process of recycling end of life metal goods. Dust that first existed as ore extracted from the ground, from the soil beneath our feet. As I consider what it means to declare that we are dust and to dust we shall return. 10th Ward Alderman Susan Sidlowski Garza has said, our community has demanded to be heard repeatedly and no person should have to starve themselves in order to have their concerns be taken seriously. Garza's ward includes East Side, Hedwich, Jeffrey Manor, South Chicago and South Deering. She's a daughter of the community, a graduate of that same George Washington High School a former school counselor, a teacher's union leader, a member of both the Latino caucus and the Progressive Reform Caucus who ran on a platform of cracking down on pet coke processing plants. No person, she says, should have to starve themselves in order to have their concerns taken seriously. And yet, hunger strikes are one of the most powerful and dramatic tools at the disposal of those who practice the discipline of nonviolent resistance. Hunger strikes played an important role in the Indian independence movement. Here in the West, of course, we're most familiar with the strikes carried out by Mahatma Gandhi, but he was not the only one. Hunger strikes were also undertaken by Bhagat Singh, Bharukesh Wardut, Jatin Das, whose strike led to his death. In America and Great Britain, suffragettes organizing for women's voting rights were sometimes imprisoned and would undertake hunger strikes from jail to draw attention to their cause. Their names also are not as well known but are no less important. Marion Dunlap, Mary Clark, Alice Paul, many others. But we don't need to look for examples only from the distant past. Here in Chicago, just five years ago, there was a hunger strike that lasted 34 days after the city of Chicago moved to close Diet High School just a mile from LSTC's campus on the north end of Washington Park. As a result of that hunger strike, the city changed course and kept the school open, although the protesters demand for a new focus on green technology and global leadership at the school weren't met. And so today, this Ash Wednesday, I'm holding the witness of these powerful hunger strikes in mind. As I consider the words of the prophet Isaiah, shout out, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Later in that reading, the prophet confronts the leaders of the people who are seeking to change their fortunes by fasting without addressing the unjust power relations in their communities 
echoing their words back to them. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Isaiah contends that their fasting is insincere. They are attempting to move God to action before they have acted themselves to set right the harms they have caused. Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers, God replies. It calls to my mind one of the signs carried by a protester at a block the permit rally last fall that read, three times less income, 60% more asthma. Beyond his condemnation of the people's hypocrisy, I think the prophet Isaiah is trying to help the nation reimagine who God is, how God's power works, and what it means to be God's people. By their fasting, the nation is attempting to create a change in their circumstances. And their logic is actually very much in keeping with the logic of the hunger strike and goes back not only to ancient Israel, but to ancient Ireland and ancient India as well, where fasting at the door of one who owed you a debt or who had wronged you in some way was a means of dramatizing the injustice being committed and shaming the offender into right action. Today, hunger strikers here in Chicago are fasting in the virtual public square as a way of shaming the city into acknowledging that it owes them something, that it has a duty to care for and protect them and not to let them fall into harm's way. In the language of community organizing, we might say that the protesters have conducted an accurate power analysis and have selected tactics designed to move leaders who have the power to act. For the prophet Isaiah, the problem with the people's fast is that they have conducted a self-serving, inaccurate power analysis that denies their own culpability and responsibility for their actions. Instead, God says, is not this the fast that I choose? to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide from your own kin? Not to hide from your own kin. What a poetic and painful way to describe and define sin. Just one of the many ways that scripture tries to correct our self-obsessed myopia. The lawyer asks, who is my neighbor? And Jesus replies with the parable of the Good Samaritan. The elder brother in the parable of the prodigal accuses this son of yours, and the father corrects him, this brother of yours. Sarah casts out Hagar. Jacob cheats Esau. Joseph's brothers sell him into slavery. Again and again throughout human history, we deny the ties that bind, and we hide ourselves from our own kin. We are even alienated from the very earth out of which we are created, the dust from which we were formed. God speaks to the first humans in the third chapter of Genesis saying, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it, you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Cursed is the ground because of you. Thorns and thistles, mercury and manganese, chromium and cyanide, 
and lead, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. The end of life is, of course, also the only place where real resurrection can happen. And we do not trace the sign of the cross on our brows only with ash and soil. We also make this sign with water and with oil. Those preparing to be baptized at Easter are sometimes welcomed at the beginning of their catechesis with a rite in which the sign of the cross is made over their ears and eyes and lips, heart, shoulders, hands, and feet as a reminder that our bodies are sacred and places of encounter with God's wisdom and God's word. In baptism, the church asks us to renounce the ways of sin that draw us from God, to repent of our participation and collusion with the powers of this world that rebel against God, to return to the Lord and to turn toward our neighbor, our siblings, our kin in love. To disclose, to unveil, to remember that we are part of one body. That, to use the words of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Which, as a consequence, means that we must also avoid the trap of scapegoating and practice love of enemy, which begins with a commitment to deep listening and honest engagement with those with whom we disagree. Southside Recycling has attempted to directly address the concerns of community activists. They've clarified that they're not a manganese or a pet coke operation. They've argued that their technology will set a new standard for containing dust and noise. They've refuted the claim that they're simply relocating their operations from an affluent white community on the north side to a working class community of color on the southeast side. They've pointed out the necessity of recycling facilities to reduce our need for harmful and unsustainable mining practices. They raise questions about manufacturing and its relationship to consumer culture that implicate us all. How does our demand for steel goods drive the processes that harm our bodies and the earth's? Do we only care about mining and steel mills and metal recycling when the impacts land on our front steps? How far away would we need to export this problem before we could stop thinking about it? The South Side? The Southern Hemisphere? Who is our neighbor? It is at this level of the conversation that the need for spiritual disciplines like fasting, almsgiving, and prayer begin to make more sense. As we move away from casting all responsibility on God to fix the problems humanity has created, we discover our need for disciplines, habits of the heart that can turn us from the most narrow self-interest to a more expansive collective interest. We begin to set limits on our consumption of goods that harm our bodies and the earth. We find ways to redistribute and make reparations for the unjust hoarding of resources which God has provided for the common good. We take action to care for and protect our kin, praying with our feet when necessary. In these ways, we display what we treasure most, investing our whole lives in caring for one another, preparing ourselves for the life to come when humanity and all of creation will be restored. 
Amen.